gossip. <laughs> are you ever afraid that people are gossiping about you? How do you feel when members of your family gossip about each other? Most of us know that gossip is destructive and that it's nearly impossible to build healthy relationships or create a safe environment on top of the mistrust that gossip creates. Now here's what I mean by gossip. Never speak in a diminishing way about anyone. Never listen to anyone diminish somebody else. Never share something that was shared with you in confidence. And never say something about someone that you wouldn't be willing to say directly to their face. And if you do, and you will, because we're humans, take responsibility right away. Apologize and restore your integrity. What would it be like if there was no gossip in your life? Not with your family, your friends, where you work or go to school? What kind of a difference would that make? My husband and I, we started a business 10 years ago, and we created not gossiping as one of our ground rules. And here's what we found out. Once people start to realize that it's safe, nobody's talking behind anybody else's back, they begin to trust one another. And when that happens, then we can start putting our attention on opening our hearts on cultivating love, rather than trying to look good or save face or keep it all together. The people in our company, they don't just go to work together. They've come to really care about each other. There's four other tools, in addition to not gossiping, that I'm going to share with you today. They're all part of something that we created called Sacred Commerce. It's a way of working with organizations, businesses, communities, families, really anyone that desires a more heart-based culture in a safe environment. We just happen to start in the workplace because you and I are going to spend about 90,000 hours of our lives there. We actually train people in love as a way of being, and then we turn them loose in a retail environment. Our customers keep coming back because they say they can feel the difference and they want to be a part of that. Now, we use these tools to teach people that love is an inside job and it's our job, yours and mine, to cultivate that love rather than try to earn love or get recognition by getting the circumstances of life right. Now, the love I'm talking about. It's not boy meets girl. It's not familial. It's not even personal. It's agape. It's a presence that fills us when we set our personal wants and desires aside. So imagine for a moment if this new prosperity, if a measure of success if the new American dream now includes, how much love can we hold in our hearts? How can we make our lives about being of service to others rather than the existing pursuit of happiness based on material prosperity? Now these tools, they're gonna sound familiar, but listen, because there's a new twist on. So the first one we call being transparent. And here's what we mean by that. The willingness to expose ourselves, to share what you don't want to share. There's the things you say. There's the things you share. And they give you your life, the life you're living right now. But then there's what you don't share, what you're afraid to say. And that keeps you living in fear. When that fear is present, when it has a grip on you, you can't really connect with other people and build meaningful relationships. Inside of us, that fear is saying, no, don't say that. They may not like you. 
And so we don't. We stay hidden. Sometimes it's from the people that we love the most. That fear, that's an egoic mechanism. That fear of not being liked or not being accepted. And it's designed to keep us out of our hearts. We call this the journey from our head to our heart. Perhaps one of the longest journeys you'll ever take. It's about giving up, being charmed by the material world, by the goodies and all the upgrades at the expense of living from our hearts. Here's an example. There's a couple in our community, and they were engaged to be married. She started feeling distant. She was afraid of the upcoming commitment. He noticed. It felt awkward. So they sat down together, committed to putting everything on the table, being completely transparent. She was courageous. She said, most of the time, I don't feel like kissing you. Really, I don't want to be around you. In fact, a lot of the time, I'm just plain old disgusted. He listened, and he let his immediate emotional knee-jerk reaction pass. And then he said to her, babe, this isn't what I'm committed to, but I want to tell you what I immediately wanted to say. You are so ungrateful. Get out of my house. But really, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And she listened, and then she said, it feels so good to just get my demons out instead of hiding inside with my fear. It was so good to trust you to not take that personally. (laughs) That's the power of being transparent. They've been married five years. They're more in love than ever before. The second tool I want to share with you is apology. Now, I used to resist apologizing because it felt like what I was saying was, okay, okay, you're right, I'm wrong, I'm sorry. It just, it didn't feel empowering and I'm not even sure it was all that helpful. But the kind of apology we're talking about is taking responsibility, not assigning blame. We tell our management team, managers always apologize first and often, taking 100% responsibility. Maybe you're a manager. Maybe you're thinking, why should they apologize if they didn't do anything wrong? But remember, we're not talking about right and wrong. We're talking about workability, creating workability. I mean, after all, what are you more committed to? being right and domineering, or kind and empowering. See, apology is a tool for giving up our position, giving up being right. I'm going to give you an example from my own life. The father of my two oldest children was a Vietnam veteran, and he struggled with heroin addiction. We'd been divorced 30 years. When I called him up one day and I said, Jimmy, I want to apologize for our divorce. It wasn't your fault. And it was quiet on the other end of the phone. And I could tell he was holding back tears. And then I added, I don't blame you. And I said, do you have any requests of me? And I listened. And he shared, I'm I'm going to turn 60 in a month. And I'd love it if you guys would bring the kids and come to my birthday party. So we did. My husband and I, all three of my children, their spouses, and four grandchildren, who were all Jimmy's grandchildren that he'd never met. We went to his party. Now, we were the only people there. And I'll never forget that trip. Because I could see the difference it made for him, but really, It made a difference in all of our lives. My grandchildren still talk about Grandpa Jimmy like he's a part of our daily existence. 
See, that's the power of giving up a position and the willingness to take responsibility. The next tool I want to share with you is making requests. See, before I apologized to Jimmy, I spent 33 years waiting for him to send something in the mail to the children, expecting it, and then being disappointed when it didn't come. Somebody told me once, expectations suck the joy out of life. (laughs) Well, that was my experience. (laughs) Consider that expectations are oftentimes requests we just don't make or we're afraid to make. Why? Because we don't want to hear the answer, no. We take it personally. We make it mean all kinds of things, other than not right now. But kids know that it means not right now. When my kids were little, they'd say, hey, mommy, can I have a cookie? I'd say, no, babe. Mom, can I have a cookie? No. Well, what about now? (laughs) But you and I, we make it mean you don't like me. You don't think my idea is great. You're not supportive. We add all kinds of personal baggage to it. If we really got that no just means not right now, we'd be way more powerful in making requests. And it's impossible to grow a project or an idea if you can't make requests of other people. Making requests is a way of empowering other people. It's letting them know how they can support you, how they can participate. So I invite you, start getting no's. Go out there. It'll help you be more powerful in making requests. Now here's an example of a woman who kept making her request and didn't stop when she heard no. Her name's Belinda. She's one of our managers. She was nine months old when her parents split up. She had one picture of her father and she always wondered about him. She was learning how to make requests, and she told us, I'm going to write my dad a letter and request to meet him. And she did. And she got back a response, and he said, put your energy towards loving the family that raised you. But she didn't take that, no. Two years later, we were in Los Angeles, and she said, I'm going to go to his house and see if he's home. I thought she was brave. She did. She went to his house. She knocked on the door. An elderly woman opened the window next to the door just a little bit. She leaned in and she said, my name's Belinda. Is Charlie here? And the lady shooed her away and said, go away. Nobody's home. The family's in Las Vegas. So she walked back to her car and she said, it just wasn't good enough. So she decided to write him a letter. And she had this insight when she was writing the letter to address it to Charlie and his wife, and she did. And in the letter, she told her dad, I love my life, and I acknowledge you. I thank you for giving me this life. And I don't want anything from you. I just want to meet you. And she acknowledged his wife for loving all of Charlie's children. Two weeks later, she got an email from a woman named Evelyn, Charlie's wife. And Evelyn said, thank you so much for including me in that letter, because now I feel like I can get involved and I'm going to help you meet your dad. And she did. And the next time Belinda walked up to that door, they opened it wide, and she got a hug by a half-brother and sister who looked just like her. And she not only met her father, but she got answered a question that had haunted her her whole life, when he said, I've always thought about you, and I love you. So don't get stopped by the nose. Go start making those requests you're afraid to make. The final tool I want to share with you is called acknowledgement. I love watching award ceremonies when people get the award and they acknowledge the people in their life. They oftentimes acknowledge the people for what they've done, how they've helped them in their achievement. But sometimes they acknowledge people for who they are, for a way of being. And when they do that, we get moved. I cry. Acknowledgement is a way 
of calling forth the best in one another. If you want to impact your family and your community right now, start acknowledging people. Look for those qualities that we all aspire to. They're there waiting for us to become them and call them forth in your acknowledgement. All but two of our managers over the past 10 plus years of business have come up through our organization. And I believe it's because we acknowledge people into leadership roles. Remember when you first fell in love and you and your sweetie were acknowledging the other all the time? You, were, you thought they were perfect. You were saying how funny you are, how creative, how handsome, how beautiful. Okay, fast forward. Six weeks, six months, six years. You're not acknowledging anybody anymore. And you think they've changed. When all that's really happened is you've stopped seeing their greatness. See, acknowledgement is not just a way of calling forth the best in others. It's a way to realign our vision when we've stopped seeing their divinity. We've stopped seeing their greatness. So start acknowledging people more. In closing, I want to share with you that if you really take on love's an inside job, you'll not only be able to navigate life's challenges, you'll be able to work through them. And you'll be able to go on and create more powerful, meaningful relationships in every area of your life. Now, here's my outrageous proposal that I have just for you. Today, right now, stop gossiping. Start putting your attention on making powerful requests, acknowledging the people in your life. Whenever there's an upset, look and see what can you take responsibility for and apologize and be willing to be more transparent. Let people into your life, into your world. I promise you, it'll change your life. You start being wherever you are, love is. God bless you and thank you.